Thanks, Vicki. Welcome everybody to the December 14th Cascade Speakeasy and Electric Toasters meeting. It looks like we've got a few guests here tonight. It's going to be a good evening. At this point, I'd like to turn it over to our Sergeant at Arms, Rob Tidd. Rob, would you lead us off with the Pledge of Allegiance? I would be happy to, Mr. President. If everyone would please mute themselves, focus on my voice and my screen, and repeat after me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Back to you, Mr. President. Thank you, Rob. Excellent job there. And I'm going to just roll this right back over to you as you are our Toastmaster this evening. Well, thank you, Mr. President. It's nice to see everyone here tonight. I'm very thrilled that we have two guests. Stanley Crane, who I know personally, uh, has been here a couple of times. Tammy, I have to apologize. I don't know you. Did, were you invited by Kathleen McNulty? Yes. Kathleen, would you introduce Tammy for us? Yes. Uh, Tammy McBride is with the um, ESD. Do I have the right acronym? I ran, uh, I ran across her in the school system maybe a year ago, and we talked about this. And then I happened to run into her on email a few weeks ago, and I re-invited her, and here she is. So, Tammy, do you want to be more eloquent about what your role is with the school system? Yeah, sure. Um, I hope you can all hear me. Thank you for having me tonight. I, um, I am from, uh, well, born and raised in Ellensburg. I landed this position here in Wenatchee. Um, my husband and I are, well, I'm new to the area. Uh, so we've been here about a year and um, about a year and a half I've been in this position. And uh, I do career connected learning for the North Central Educational Service District. So um, our region, we serve uh, five counties. So it's Chelan, Douglas, Okanagan, Grant, and Adams counties. Um, so I do career exploration for students K through 12. Wonderful. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing, Tammy. Thank you for joining us as well as Shanley. At this point in time, I think, oh, we have one more guest. Sasha, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Sasha is a friend of mine who I serve on the East Wenatchee City Council with. She has been a guest with us once before, and I'm glad that she's here. To Actually, have you been with us before, Sasha? Yes, once I managed to sneak away, finally, at 5.30, so. Good, well, thank you for joining us. This is great to have so many guests with us tonight. I Thanks would like to hear Christina's joke of the day. All right. Santa Claus is getting just a bit senile and he needs help remembering the names of all of his reindeer. So he needs your help. Can you help him name his reindeer? Rudolph. Okay. You mean all of them? All of them, yes. Oh. Dasher and Dancer and Prancer and Dixon, Comet and Cupid and Donder and Blitzen. And Rudolph. And Rudolph. <laughs> but Santa Sink, he's saying there's one more. Bob. Do you know the name of his other reindeer? Bob. He says, what, what about Olive, the other reindeer? <laughs> Very good. Thank you, Christina. Good You're joke. Welcome. Before we move on with our program, I would like to introduce our uh, additional guests this evening. Selena Danko is a friend of mine. She's also on the link uh, board. Actually, the link. You tell us what you do, Selena. I am in marketing and outreach for Link Transit. There you go. So thank you so much for joining us tonight, Selena. Thank you for the invite. You're welcome. We don't have any program changes this evening. Unfortunately, Lloyd is not going to be with us this evening, so we will not have a report from the VP of Education. Therefore, at this juncture, 
I would like to introduce our general evaluator this evening. Please welcome back to the stage, Christina Stepper. Thank you, Rob, Mr. Toastmaster. My job tonight as general evaluator will be to oversee the structure of the meeting. The structure of our meetings include a group of volunteers who fulfill various roles. Each week, these roles change. So all of us get an opportunity to practice each of these roles. One of the other things I do as general evaluator is watch to be sure that we stay on time. Toastmasters meetings last one hour, 5.30 to 6.30. 6.30, we will be adjourning the meeting this evening. I would like to introduce my team this evening. Each of them can tell you what their role is. At the end of the meeting, they'll get to report. The first member of my team this evening is our evaluator, speech evaluator, Dean Karath. Dean, will you tell all of us what you will be doing this evening? Once I get unmuted, I will tell you. I will be evaluating a speech tonight. That's a very important function of Toastmasters to provide feedback. And if you're giving a speech to obtain feedback, that's one of the main mechanisms by which we improve. I will be evaluating Jackie's speech. It's a project, inspire your audience from level three of the engaging humor pathway. It's not necessarily going to be a humorous speech, but it's in that path. The purpose of the speech is to inspire us, the audience, and it will last five to seven minutes. Back to you. Thank you, Dean. We all have the opportunity to comment on Jackie's speech, to share things with her that we especially appreciate about her speech. If there's a suggestion that you have to make, you're welcome to do that too. When she is finished with her speech, the timer will give us one minute and you'll be able to type those notes to her in the chat section. So if you have a piece of paper to jot down thoughts while she's speaking, that would be excellent. Our guests are encouraged and welcome to participate in that exercise as well. The next member of our team is our timer, Joyce Matheson. Joyce, would you share what you'll be doing this evening? Yes, I will. But before I do, just in case any of our guests are confused, this is the way we clap. This is the ASL version of applause, just in case you didn't know. Back to business at hand. Jackie will be doing a five to seven speech, five to seven minute speech, I apologize. Five minute is our handy dandy sign of the times toilet paper green. At six minutes, we have mellow yellow. And for seven minutes, we have the finish bomb. We will go to table topics next, one minute. Green, two, wait, not two, one and a half. You would think I would learn one and a half mellow yellow and two bombs away. After that, we will have an evaluation from Dean. Two minutes, green, two and a half minutes, mellow yellow, and three, the big bomb. Back to you. Thank you, Joyce. The next member of our team is our grammarian tonight. Ian Adams will be serving in that role. Ian, would you share with the group what you'll be doing? I'd be happy to. Thank you, Ms. Evaluator. Tonight, I will be holding the role as the grammarian. And one of the jobs that the grammarian does is keeps track of exemplary sentence structure, visual descriptions, or unique word combinations. In addition to those, I also get to name the word of the evening. 
And going off of Lloyd's theme for the evening of personal liberties and responsibilities, I used or selected the word culpable. And culpable is defined as deserving blame. An example of culpable in a sentence is, sometimes you're just as culpable if you watch something as when you actually participate. I'll be keeping track of how many people are using the word culpable correctly tonight, and I'll report back at the end of the evening. Back to you, Mrs. Evaluator. Thank you, Ian. The next member of the team this evening is our awe counter, Kathleen McNulty. Kathleen, would you explain your role, please? Thank you, Madam Evaluator. My role is to keep track of the filler words or words that we all use as crutches. Things like ah, uh, um, er, well, so, like. I'll be keeping track of that on my handy dandy little cheat sheet, making tick marks and reporting at the end. I will not be making much eye contact because I'll be concentrating on what people are saying. So I am not ignoring you. Oh, I get, give myself a so right there. <laughs> I would like to point out that no one is culpable simply because there are tick marks on the sheet. It's merely a learning experience so we can all improve. Back to you. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you, team. Very well presented. Tonight, we begin the body of the meeting with our Toastmaster. I will turn it back to you, Rob. Thank you, Madam General Evaluator. Our first speech tonight is a story of pain and loss, of music and family, of hope, and of the greatest gift we can give each other this Christmas. Please welcome to the stage, Jackie Graybill and her speech, The Bells. The Bells by Jackie Graybill. If I told you his name, I'm sure you would recognize him. He's an artist world renowned, but you might not know that his wife, who he was in love with, for the 18 years of their marriage, died of a fire. It was a freak accident, a routine house fire. And this led him into a deep, deep depression. And he was just starting to come out of it when his oldest son decided so much is going on in this country that is wrong and I want to help right it. I want to help fight racial injustice. And so he went states away and his father was worried about him. And one day he got a call and the call said, your son has the virus. He's not contagious anymore, but you're gonna to have to come and pick him up because it's gonna be months before he recovers. He had just recovered when he decided to go back in the fight on the front lines in something that he believed and was passionate about. Fast forward to November and his father got another call. The call was his son had been involved in a shooting and the bullet had barely missed his spinal cord, had barely missed his son becoming paralyzed for the rest of his life. So he was gonna to need to go and pick up his son once more. He brought his son back and his other children, as, as Christmas has been approaching, they said to him, dad, dad, let's, let's listen to Christmas music. Let's put on your favorite songs. But he feared that he would never have a Merry Christmas again. And then something happened that changed everything. out of the door of his house on Christmas day and he heard the bells. Next week it'll be Christmas 2020 and it will be 157 years 
since Henry Wadsworth Longfellow stepped out of his house on Christmas morning and heard the bells on Christmas day. He was a poet, the most a famous American poet of his day. And he had been through so much. He heard the bells and something creative in him started. He grabbed a piece of paper and he started writing down some lines. I heard the bells on Christmas day. Their old familiar carols play and wild and sweet, the words repeat, a peace on earth, goodwill to men. But then in his next stanza, he got real about how he was really feeling about his year, about his wife's death, about the polarization in the country where each side thought the other was culpable. And later we would come to call the Civil War. This was in 1863. And he wrote, and in despair, I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Anybody felt like that this year? Felt like hate is the only thing that I see all around me this year. And it's, it's mocking the possibility of us having peace towards each other and wishing each other good, goodwill. He went on with more stanzas, but one of them was particularly beautiful. Then peal the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong will fail, the right prevail. With peace on earth, goodwill to men. He had the belief that wrong was going to fail, that racism was going to be defeated. And in another beautiful stanza, he ended it, till ringing singing on its way, the world revolved from night to day. A voice, a chime, a chant sublime of peace on earth, goodwill to men. I feel that this year, so many of us have lost so much. We may have lost our health, we may have lost loved ones, security, in finances. We have even lost the ability to go and have a coffee with a friend. But as we approach the end of this year, I want to invite you to think about what you do have. To think about the family that you have near, the joy that Christmas can still bring in spite of all this craziness that we're experiencing. And I hope that the greatest gift that we can give each other is not material, but is peace. Peace that we have towards each other, peace that we can offer each other and the hope for goodwill to each of us. Mr. Toastmaster. Thank you, Jackie. Joyce, would you please give us one minute for everyone to give their comments to Jackie in the chat box. Guests, you're welcome to also comment on her speech if you would like. Okay, we're on. Thank you.
one minute. Thank you very much, Joyce. We are going to go into our next segment of the meeting, and that is table topics, which I'm really looking forward to because tonight the theme is personal liberties and responsibilities. And I have to just say one thing before we get started, and that is my wife took a personal liberty in coloring my hair and none of you noticed. I Actually, can't be held culpable for my bad eyesight. And I was about to say, I'm actually the culpable one. However, I was surprised that no one commented on the fact that Jackie and I had the same hair color this evening. It's one, of those, it's, it, it's one of those things where, you know, you, you don't say to a woman, are, are you pregnant? <laughs> you know, because if you say, is your hair colored and it isn't, where are you? Well, you're not bald, I can tell you that. Well, I thought about doing an, an Ian haircut, but instead I decided to go with the hair coloring. Well, you look good. Well, thank you. I would like to now ask our table topics master to please come to the stage and tell us what table topics is all about. Please welcome Mary Syrie. Before she jumps in, I, I wonder if you're gonna be doing eyeshadow soon or <laughs> okay <laughs> I, I you know ron you've got brown hair and you dyed it brown so <laughs> there you go <laughs> table topics i am the table topic master for this evening and in table topics we practice extemporaneous speaking that is speaking off the cuff i will ask a question of someone, several people, and they will provide an answer. One to two minutes worth of speaking. This, this is a skill that comes in handy in conversation, at work meetings, at job interviews, a host of other places. But before I get started, Jackie, that song, I sang to a friend of mine in June who called me very upset about the rioting that was going on. And those words got me through it too. I, I think it's a beautiful poem and a beautiful Christmas carol. Thanks for reminding us. Personal liberties and responsibilities. I changed this a little in my mind as I was coming up with table topics to personal liberties versus social responsibilities. I had to look up a definition of personal liberties to get me started. And here's a legal definition I found. Personal liberty is the liberty of an individual to behave as one pleases, except for those restraints imposed by the law and codes of conduct of the society in which one lives to safeguard the physical, moral, political, and economic welfare of others. I wish I'd looked that up weeks and months ago. I, I find that to be a very comforting definition, although I think there are many in our society <laughs> who would not agree with it. Most of my table topics questions focus on mask wearing in public indoor spaces, according to our governor's recommendations. A few weeks ago in Table Topics, I praised our community for wearing masks, citing my early morning grocery shopping experiences as proof of compliance. But shortly after my accolades, I had to go to the grocery store on a Saturday afternoon. Different crowd. <laughs> there were lots of bare faces, and I have to say it was mostly young men in the 20 to 30 year old range. At checkout, I mentioned this to the clerk and he shook his head ruefully and said that they were told by management not to, re not to refuse services and not to confront these individuals. Lucas, if you were the store manager, how would you deal with intransigent customers such as these? Thanks, Mary. I think 
the first thing that I would do is politely ask the customers to wear a mask. I think that the stores are having to comply with the regulations set by the government. And to shop at the store, the customers should have to follow those rules. If they don't follow them, I believe that those stores should be able to, to refuse service to them. And unfortunately, they can probably ask them to leave. That's probably unfortunate though, because in the morning, they might have had a hot coffee from Starbucks. If they were at Starbucks, or if they were at Safeway, they probably had a fresh coffee on their way to work. So that is unfortunate because they couldn't have their coffee in the morning and they, if they don't have their masks on. So overall, I think it's best that they just put their mask on so that they can have their coffee and the clerk doesn't have to hassle them and everybody can go about their day and try to get through this bizarre time. Back to you, Mary. It is a bizarre time, isn't it? Pat, in the same vein, I, I have a friend who works at the pharmacy in one of our grocery stores. She told me this story. A young woman not wearing a mask was in line with other people waiting to get their prescriptions. When an elderly woman asked her why she was not wearing a mask, her response was this, it's not a law. It's just a recommendation and I choose not to wear one. If you were in line with her, what would your response be? What, what would you say to her? I think that what I would say is, you know, we have a very dangerous epidemic going on right now. And it's very contagious. We've just learned that more people in the United States have died than were killed in World War II. Therefore, if you wear a mask, it's not a law, but it's a way of showing your caring and your love and your respect for other people. And you look to me like the kind of person who takes that kind of thing very seriously. I, I encourage you to think about that a little bit further and be the person that you are and contribute your share to the positive experiences that can come out of this tragedy. That's what I would probably say. I love that you put a little sugar on it. <laughs> My thought was, well, it's, you know, it's not against a lot of sneeze in someone's face. Would you be okay if I did that to you? But then that's me. Well, all those years of teaching elementary school, you know, you need to learn how to give feedback in positive ways and encourage positive behavior by validating people rather than condemning them, unless they're just jerks and then you go a whole other way. <laughs> Good for you. Yes, uh, it speaks to my background in IT. Vicki, I did a little research on Reddit on the question, why don't you wear a mask? So here's some of the more creative answers. I'm claustrophobic. I can't breathe and a mask induces a panic attack. Another said masks don't prevent disease. There's no evidence that shows mask wearing is effective. This is my favorite. My body needs oxygen, not carbon dioxide from breathing my own breath. But my very favorite and very good one was from an immunologist. And th this is why he does wear a mask. Goes along with what Pat just said. I am an immunologist. I wear my mask because it makes people feel better. It's a simple act that gives people peace of mind. Vicki, have you heard any other crazy or really plausible poetic reasons on, from people on why they don't wear a mask? Thank you, Mary. I have not heard any of those types of excuses other than what you've read. I like the last one that you read because that's kind of my stance is that I don't like to wear a mask. However, I wear one because it may be protecting me and it may be protecting my 
fellow Americans and who I'm around. And so I just choose to wear one because I want to be on the safe side. Um, it's not something that I'm like to do. And sometimes I will jump out of the car and get halfway into the store before. And it's like, oh, wait a second, got to go back and get the mask. And I do. It's just not one of those habits that I have gotten into, even though we've been having to wear one for nine months. And they say, you know, you can create a habit within 21, 28 days. And you would think I would have this, but it seems like I'm always reminding myself, oh, got to remember to do this. And if I choose to do more than one errand where I have to get into the public, I will um, wear my mask around my neck so that I remember to put it back on. <laughs> Because it's just one of those things. Um, I think that sometimes people don't wear masks because they truly are not in the habit of wearing them and forget it and have already gotten into the store. And so they don't want to turn around and go back. That might be one of the reasons, Mrs. Table Topics Master. That's good. That's good. I'm, I'm reminded of one day I was at Albertsons and a lady about my age came up to me and she she didn't have a mask on and she said, oh my gosh, I, I had a mask when I got in the store and it must have fallen off somewhere. What, what should I do? And I said, take off your bra and put <laughs> the cup around your face. I was pretty proud of myself for thinking that. <laughs> we had a good laugh over that. I've got one for Steve Schwind. Steve, some business owners would argue that Governor Inslee's COVID-19 restrictions are not consistent with safeguarding the economic welfare of our society. Businesses that have to close down is what we're referring to. What would you change in the governor's policies, if anything? Thank you for that question. <clears throat> I, I'm truly struggling with that. I've watched videos of business owners who are lamenting these shutdowns. And I'm hearing stories of, I'll, I'll use Seattle, 40% of the restaurants in Seattle are dead and gone. Wow. It's, it's over for them. Locally, I know there's some fallout. And I was watching a gym owner who was talking about why gyms should be open. Gyms should be open because we don't have a documented case of, of COVID contraction in, in the gym because people have been mindful of it. They're healthy. The air is moving through the gym. They're, they're, they're keeping their distance. They're wearing masks or maybe they're not wearing masks, but they're still keeping distance. I feel like an ironclad shutdown is a bit oppressive for us. It, it, we paid the price. I have a family member who on Facebook did a post on a defensive posturing for the state of South Dakota where there is no mask requirements. And she said, we're being earmarked as the state with the biggest impact of COVID and she said, the statistics are not there for us being the worst state. And she stated statistics for other states that are mask required states and are not experiencing any more COVID cases than these, these states with masks. I'm in favor of masks, I guess, because it is a safeguard, it's a courtesy but to just blanket uniformly close businesses down, I'm not 100% sold on that. I think people can navigate in society with some rules and some personal common sense. Yeah. I would, I would, I see that big F. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you for your I'm going to keep going though. 
so I think some allowance for people to continue to do at least a percentage of business is what I would implement if it were up to me. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. I think that's really interesting. And I'm going to ask Eric Stepper the same question. What, would, what changes would you make to the governor's restrictions uh, during this COVID-19, if any? I think that, uh, I think it should be case by case and have, have people make a case. I mean, the gym owners, holy cow, they are just making all kinds of, uh, some of them are making all kinds of uh, concessions to having social distance, wiping everything down, airflow, all those kinds of things. There's restaurants that are, are making, uh, when you go in there, you feel safe. There's tables in between. I think that uh, it, it is, there's a balance there and I think that he's being just a little bit onerous on, on some of these requirements. I, I understand that we need to keep this thing under control, but man, we can't kill our economy. So I think that he needs to loosen up a little bit. And I think that he should have people be able to demonstrate that they have uh, safe businesses and that, uh, that they can make a case for that and have, have some people visit and, and make a determination. Thank you, Table Topics Master. You bet, you bet. When I was coming up with questions for this topic, I found that every topic I would come up with, I started writing a speech for it. Because there's a lot to be said about personal liberties, responsibilities, and these, these times that we are in. For our four guests, would you like to give it a try? I've got a couple questions left. They're not as difficult as the ones I just asked. Shanley, are you interested? Okay, all sure. right. Thank you, Adam. Okay, no. Shanley, have your, your views on personal life, I'm sorry, I'll start over again. Have your views on personal liberties and social responsibility changed this year? Thank you, Madam Table Topics. I would say yes, because I believe that I took them for granted uh, much more up until March 16th, 17th, when they were taken away. Um, in a sense, I feel captive and constraint of things that I really love to do. And today was a really difficult day for me for some odd reason. I have been able to go out and play pickleball and do other things to keep active. It's, it's quite a bit colder right now. Can't go to the gym. Took our dog for a walk. It just wasn't enough. And I want, I want to go back to the gym. I'll wear my mask. I'll do whatever. I want to go back to the gym. So yes, I definitely think my liberties were taken away. I agree with some of the other people's opinions tonight as far as I think there can be a happy medium where we can still be safe, but yet allow these businesses to, to continue. I just heard tonight that one of our favorite restaurants was going to get tents Thursday. They just started doing outdoor beverage service and they hope to be able to open their kitchen on Monday. And I'm so happy for them because they have really struggled. So, yes, long answer, yes. Yes, that was a good answer. Thank you, thank you. Sasha, would you like to try a question? Sure. Okay. Can you tell us about an experience where you had to make a choice between a personal liberty and social responsibility. And how did you resolve that conflict? Hmm. Thank you. Well, I think we've all made a lot of these choices a lot this year, uh, given the topic and the, the climate that we live in. 
I try very hard to walk a very fine line between these and I take my personal responsibility to keep my grandparents safe and healthy very, um, very seriously. I moved in with my grandparents at the beginning of the pandemic in, in isolation in order to take care of them. And so that was a, a personal responsibility choice that I made at, at great sacrifice to other aspects of my life, but I'm very happy that I did that in service to them in order to keep them safe and so that they could have their groceries and everything else. My mom and I worked together on that and I'm happy that I did it. And it, it sounds like a sacrifice, but it wasn't too much of one. And I've just tried to keep that mentality throughout 2020, that there's a balance that we can do things safely, like others have said, but we can also take responsibility for the greater good and, and our small contribution to it, like wearing a mask and doing things to keep our businesses open. Like many of you have said, there's definitely a lot of businesses owners out there like Blair McKaney and Evie Gillen who are keeping their gyms very, very safe. Um, and it is a great tragedy that they can't continue to provide that service to us. So I think it's a, it's a delicate balance, but one that we all need to, to play. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Tammy and Selena, I can squeeze two more in. Tammy, do you want to give it a try? It's up to you. Sure. I've actually gone through all my questions, so I will recycle one for you. But if there's one, and, and uh, Selena, same for you. If there's a question I've asked that you'd like to speak to, that's good. Otherwise, I will ask you, let's see. I think I like the one about, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, just speaking on the topic that we are just discussing. Yeah. Um, so personally, my husband works in EMS and he is a first responder. So our family has been quite uh, drastic with the measures that have been taken. Uh, we have a uh, I guess, I don't know what to, a decontamination area in our house uh, because of his job. So there's been a lot of precautions, uh, even just within our own household, taking off the shoes and making sure he comes through a separate door, you know, sanitizing everything and making sure that it's in a plastic bag, using hand sanitizer and gloves while he puts it in a trash bag on the way through to the washer and dryer and making sure that he's completely, you know, safe and sanitary. Uh, so there's been a lot of precautions within our own family, not just the fact that it's just, you know, him and I, it's, it's everybody. Um, there's more of a risk with us as a as well with you know healthcare providers, and I think it's been a bigger a bigger realization on our family and myself, and just between the two of us, to take that extra step and the precaution of knowing what my personal wants are versus what I need to be doing for everybody else because we are more high risk than others and other families knowing that, you know, I can't go be with my family or see my mom or my dad when a lot of people have been able to quarantine. We just never know because there's never a time that we can quarantine between just my husband and I, so. Thank you, that puts a okay. different perspective on it. Thank you very much. So yes. <laughs> very good for you and your husband too. My hats off, we all respect his service. Thank you. Thank you. Selena? Yes, I'm happy to participate. Just please recycle one of your questions. Okay, okay. I think I'd like to hear from you about Governor Inslee's restrictions. I, I know we've heard from a couple people on that, but um, those were interesting answers. And I'd like to hear your perspective on what you would change, if anything. 
If I had the ability to change Governor Inslee's restrictions for the state of Washington, I would offer him an opportunity to make the rules a little more specific to organizations. For instance, in public transportation, we are using rules from retail, restaurants, um, sort of a hodgepodge of different rules to, to govern public transportation. So we have as yet not been given specific guidance for how to um, socially distance people on our vehicles. So I would, I would give Governor Inslee an opportunity to rewrite the rules for, for transit, for retail, for restaurants, specific to those organizations. And I am culpable of using a whole lot of words that I shouldn't be. So Kathleen, I am sure you're making those wonderful tick marks on the side. Thank you so much for keeping track. <laughs> and that's a minute, that's enough ums and ahs for me. <laughs> very good. I thank everyone who participated tonight in this very interesting personal liberties versus social responsibility topic. And now I will turn the control over to the Toastmaster, Rob Tidd. Well done, Madam Table Topics Master. As a young man in my mid-20s, which you can tell from the color of my hair, it was really enlightening to hear all the perspectives that everyone had to share tonight. I truly enjoyed that. We would like to now bring back to the podium our general evaluator to kind of wrap things up for us. Please welcome back Christina Stepper. Thank you, thank you, Rob. Thank you, everyone. At this time, we get to hear from every member of the team. We'll begin with our speech evaluator, Dean Karath. Dean. Okay, I think I'm unmuted. Thank you, Jackie, for a wonderful speech. It was, I found it very timely and much needed. And I suspect a lot of others did also. I think that a lot of us have probably been feeling angry and upset over a whole host of issues. And it's just nice to hear a story that's uh, with a positive uh, message to it. I liked how you kept our attention at the start by not telling us too much, sort of leaving us hanging on the ending. And it kept my attention. I had been expecting it to be a story about this last year. So it was really quite a surprise to find out that it was 160 years ago or so, if I did my math correctly. The story was in fact quite entertaining. And you followed that up with some poems and singing that helped us understand what message you wanted us to get. And you have a very nice and wonderful voice, by the way. Prior to the evaluation, I wrote down a few questions that I thought would be useful to answer. One of them was what emotions were generated in me? And I'm happy to say that some of it was a bit of hope and forgiveness, which I think has been in rather short supply. I had been feeling a lot of hate and anger, mostly because I've been reading too much news and social media. And it's just nice to hear that there's something besides that this time of year. What was I inspired or motivated to do? Well, I was inspired to be more forgiving and less angry. And maybe I'm gonna hold off on my hitting the return button on social media a little more than I might have done. And I'm not saying I've been mean, but I'm just gonna give it a little more thought. So thank, thank you for that. One of the things they asked about was audience interaction. Well, that's kind of hard to tell on a uh, Zoom meeting, but I thought you picked a topic that everybody could certainly relate to. And my guess is that we were all inter interacting with that topic. So once again, thank you for a wonderful speech, a very timely message, and it's definitely helped me today. Thank you. 
Thank you, Dean. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. Thank you for being a member of the team this evening. The next member of our team is our timer, Joyce Matheson. Joyce, would you share your report with us, please? Yes, I would. I would love to. Jackie, you had a five to seven minute speech. Your actual time was six minutes and 25 seconds. Perfecto. Dean, you did the evaluation. Your actual time was two minutes and 48 seconds. I will go to the timer log for the table topics. Vicki, one minute, 32. Lucas, one minute, 12 seconds. Pat, one minute, one second. Steve, naughty boy, two minutes, 48 seconds. I was juggling this bomb and everything, but no, no, we will not have that. Eric, one minute, five seconds. Shanley, one minute, 36 seconds. Sasha, one minute, 38 seconds. Tammy, two minutes on the dot. Selena, one minute on the dot. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joyce. The next member of our team is our grammarian, Ian Adams. Ian? Thank you, Madam General Evaluator. Tonight, I got the opportunity to pick up on a few interesting phrases and a few words that I hadn't heard in a while. One phrase that Jackie mentioned, I questioned. You said routine house fire. And I wondered what was routine about a house fire? I don't remember any routine house fires. <laughs> You had a word, the word stanza that was used, and it took me a little while to remember what stanza meant. I finally did come up with it. You used it three times. A unique word. I haven't heard that one in a while. Probably not since high school, honestly. A phrase you had, Jackie, was polarization in the country, a very visual word or phrase for, for me, and mocking the possibility. I thought that was a pretty neat one. Mary, you used the word accolades in a very short little word burst and I forgot how you'd used it, but I wrote down the word accolades because I thought that the whole phrase was unique because of the word accolades in it. You also used intransigent customers. And I don't know what intransigent means, but I'll look that up and I got the gist of it based on your question. Put a little sugar on it, it's pretty neat. And plausible poetic reasons. I liked that chain of words. Lucas? used the word cause instead of because. So just make sure you're not shortening that word. And Vicki, twice you used gotta go, or I'm sorry, used gotta. Once was gotta go, and the second time was gotta remember instead of I have to. Steve, I like the word lamenting. And you also use the phrase a bit oppressive. Eric, one of my favorite words to use at times is oppressive. I'm sorry, I read the wrong line, onerous. Onerous is a great word, very descriptive. Shauna, one of the things you did tonight was use the word ta instead of to. So just watch out that you're pronouncing the word to correctly. And Tammy, you used the phrase him and I, and it's actually he and I. So just watch out for those, otherwise, with respect to the word of the night, it was used three times that I caught. I hope I didn't miss any. But Kathleen, Jackie, and Selena, you all used it correctly one time apiece. Thank you, Madam General Evaluator. Thank you, Ian. Thank you for a very thorough report. It is interesting and fun to listen to word and phrase usages and to have those pointed out to us as well. The next member of our team is our awe counter, Kathleen McNulty. Kathleen, would you share your report with us, please? Thank you, yes, I will. We have very low scores tonight, which in this case is excellent. Christina, as usual, clean. <laughs> Rob, I had to dig really deep and I found one kind of. I couldn't let you go clean. 
Dean Two Wells in a so. Joyce Clean. Ian Clean. Kathleen had a so. Jackie one so. Five butts. That was your your nemesis tonight. Uh, Mary Syri, two butts and a one repeated word. Lucas, I have an asterisk next to your name because you did such a great job tonight. Such a big improvement. Two so's, a few ands that could have been separate sentences, but excellent. Patricia, one repeated word. Vicki, one um, one so, one but. Steve Schwind, one like, one but, two repeated words. Eric, two ahs. Now I'm getting to our guests who all did excellent. Shanley, one um, two so's. Sasha, two ums, one well, two so's. Tammy, one um, five so's. That was Tammy's nemesis word. Selena, had one um, two so's, and after that she distracted me. <laughs> First with her giving the governor opportunities. I thought that was classic, very good. <laughs> and then referring to my counting. Good job distracting me. That's my report. <laughs> Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you to the members of the team for excellent reports tonight, for being concise and precise with your reports, helping us stay on time, finish on time. At this point, I would also like to thank all of you for coming, for using your mute buttons to keep it smooth for whoever is speaking at the time. It's just great to see all of us on. This is the largest meeting I think we've had in quite some time, 17 people on. This is so much fun. At this point, I would like to turn the meeting back over to our president, Ian Adams. Thank you, Madam General Evaluator and everybody who's taken part in this evening's meeting. Lloyd's not here, so I don't have a chance to ask him if he's got any words of wisdom from the VP Education position. Vicki, do you have anything to say from your role? No, things are moving along quite well, and I'm just excited about the new year coming up. We're, we'll be halfway through our Toastmasters year, and so all's good. Can I ask a question, Vicki? Yeah. Um, you're, I saw in the newsletter that you're having a fireside chat type thing on Wednesday, but it didn't say what time, and is that open for everybody? It is open for everybody. It is just a fireside chat to come and talk about Toastmasters. If you have questions about anything Toastmasters related, I will be there to either answer it right there on the spot or get the answer for you and get back to you. But it's just a time to come talk about pathways, what Toastmasters can do as far as your work and Toastmasters, because we have a opportunity with the new pathways to intertwine more of our work activities if we are working in um, related to Toastmasters. So it's uh, twofold. Thanks, Vicki. So for some of our guests that may not know, how might they find a way to log into this fireside, fireside talk? Okay. Uh, for some reason, I'm unable to share anything in the chat as far as fi files. Um, but for the people that invited our guests, if you could forward Lloyd's email tomorrow, it will have the link in it for the fireside chat. So just forward that to your guests. And right. it'll be at six o'clock on Wednesday. <laughs> Thanks, Vicki. Yep. Lastly, I just want to say that the electric toasters are working on restarting their morning meetings. We've got our first 7 a.m. meeting scheduled for January 6th, which is a Wednesday. So I'd like to invite anybody that would be interested from this group into or to attending that 7 a.m. meeting. Again, it will be a Zoom meeting, just the same platform that we're using here. 
And if you have any guests or friends that might be interested in a 7 a.m. Wednesday morning meeting, please let them know. With that, if there's any other questions, I'd be happy to take those now. <laughs> we have a couple. Rob? Mr. President, we don't want to forget to vote for the speaker oh. of the evening. Yes, thank you very much, Rob. For everybody, please vote for the speaker of the evening. And would you please send that vote to Rob? Rob will tally that up. And then Kathleen had a question as well, I believe. Kathleen? I was simply wondering if we're getting divorced since you're starting your morning meetings again. <laughs> it's the end of our relationship. We are just exploring our options. <laughs> In other words, yes. <laughs> he's leaving and he's taking the children with him. <laughs> Since, you, since we since we have a minute while we're doing the votes, I just food food for thought, trying to get your mind off of this COVID and all this kind of stuff. I've been I've been uh, indulging my creative side and doing puzzles and art and writing haikus. And one of them was making up words like putting spoon and fork together and making spork and cup and bowl and making culpable. And I thought, wow, it's so cool that that was the word of the day today. <laughs> He's going to go find all of the other reindeer. <laughs> <laughs> when do we expect this video to be posted and the email sent out? Will that be, say, tomorrow? Tomorrow. OK, super. Yeah. Mr. Hey. President, we have a winner. We had nearly a clean sweep, one vote actually went to one of our guests, guests this evening, but it was an overwhelming vote for the speaker of the evening, Jackie Graybill. Congratulations, Jackie. And I believe Shanley had a question. Yeah, Shanley? I did. Uh, quickly, I was wondering if Steve drew a picture of Rob was that, who was that, Steve, that you held up a picture of? Oh. It wasn't Rob. I think it was Dean. Dean. Self-portrait? Yeah. Is that Dean? Yeah. Must be Dean. <laughs> oh, wow. Very good. <laughs> All right. Any other last? It, it actually looks better from here than it does on the video. Yes, can I can I ask a question? Um, are we having since next week is Christmas week? Are we having a meeting next week? Yes, we are. Yes, cool. and the following week as well. Probably. I mean, okay. cool. I don't think many of us are going out of town and not going to be here. So. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> and it's, it's generally we won't hold it if it's actually like Christmas Eve or Christmas Day, but because it's so far apart, you know, the holidays on a Friday and Monday. So perfect. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, guests. Thank you, Toastmasters. It's always great to see you. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Bye. Yeah. Everyone, have a good week. See you next week. Eating adjourned. Bye.